Psych class. Welcome back to another unit review video, this time on Unit 8, Clinical Psychology. In this unit, we'll be taking a look at several mental health problems as well as treatment plans. There is going to be a lot of information you need to know, so I highly recommend you're following along with your review guide to make sure that you're getting down all the information that you need. In this review, we will start off by taking a look at the causes of abnormal behavior. From there, we're going to move on to psychological disorders and their classifications, and then we're going to end things off with the treatment of abnormal behavior. Usually the first thing that comes to mind when psychology is brought up, abnormal behavior is behavior defined as deviant, maladaptive, and or personally distressful. Several misconceptions about psychological disorders are present in today's society, and it is important that we clear up these misconceptions in order to get a good grade on the AP test. A psychological or mental disorder is just going to be a pattern of behavioral and psychological symptoms that cause significant personal distress, impairs the ability to function in one or more important areas of life, or both. In addition, the pattern of behavioral or psychological symptoms must represent a serious departure from the prevailing social and cultural norms. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, or the DSM, published by the American Psychiatric Association, describes the specific symptoms and diagnostic criteria for all mental disorders. Be sure not to get the American Psychiatric Association, who publishes the DSM, confused with the American Psychological Association. Same abbreviation, different organization. There are also going to be some connections between psychology and the legal system. For starters, let's talk about the insanity defense. Pleading insane is a legal term, not a psychological one. The insanity defense, also known as the mental disorder defense, is when the defendant in a criminal case argues that they are not responsible for their actions because of an episodic or persistent psychiatric illness. So basically what I mean by this is a therapist would never tell a patient that they are insane. You'll never be diagnosed with insanity. It's only a term used in the courts when someone is defending a charge against them. Confidentiality is also an important legal aspect in psychology. Confidentiality refers to the state of keeping or being kept secret or private. It is very important for psychologists to keep all patient information confidential or they'll be at risk to lose their license to practice clinical psychology. Unlike physical illnesses, where symptoms are oftentimes seen, mental health disorders are going to be a little trickier, seeing as how symptoms are not visible. This thought led psychologist David Rosenhan to question the validity of psychiatric diagnosis. In 1973, Dr. David Rosenhan of Stanford University conducted the THUD experiment. In this experiment, experimenters told staff members at psychiatric hospitals that they were hallucinating different words. The words being empty, hollow, and THUD. Once accepted into the psychiatric hospital, experimenters would then act completely normal and tell doctors that they felt fine. Even though experimenters showed no symptoms of any psychiatric illness, they still had to stay an average of 19 days in the psychiatric hospital. All but one were diagnosed with schizophrenia in remission and had to be prescribed antipsychotic medication as a condition for their release. Rosenhan then went and published his findings, which criticized the reliability of psychiatric diagnosis. Although Rosenhan's findings were groundbreaking at the time, his experiment has come under fire in recent years. In 2019, author Susanna Cahallan published Rosenhan, the Great Pretender, where Cahallan criticizes the validity of Rosenhan's findings. For starters, Cahallan stated that Rosenhan never published further data as he promised. Cahallan also found inconsistencies between the study and Rosenhan's conclusions. Before we get into the different categories of psychological disorders, let's take a quick second to talk about how different perspectives explain abnormal behavior. The medical model explains mental disorders as issues with the physical body or brain. This could be an imbalance of neurotransmitters causing anxiety or a biological predisposition to develop a psychological illness such as depression. The psychodynamic approach states that abnormal behavior is a result of conflicts or repressions of the unconscious mind. A psychodynamic psychologist might state that someone is experiencing anxiety as a result of a childhood experience that caused the individual to develop a fixation during the oral stage of psychosexual development. Humanistic psychologists believe that abnormal behavior is a result of conscious experience and how the individual perceives themselves. Cognitive psychologists believe that psychologically ill behaviors are a direct result of an irrational thought process 
the behavioral model states that psychological disorders have learning as their basis. It is possible that maladaptive behaviors were reinforced, leading to psychologically ill behaviors. Last, we have the sociocultural perspective. The sociocultural perspective focuses on how societal influences and pressures can lead to psychologically ill behaviors. Now that we understand how the different perspectives of psychology explain psychologically ill behavior, let's start talking about some of the different categories of disorders. Disclaimer, there are a lot of disorders that we need to know for the AP test, and seeing as how I don't want this video to be two hours long, I'm going to go through each disorder fairly quickly, giving you guys the basics of each one. If a specific disorder confuses you, be sure to check some of your other resources to clear up any misconceptions you may have. The way I'm going to be presenting these disorders is going to be the same way that the College Board categorizes them in the course and exam description. We're going to start off by talking about neurodevelopmental disorders and schizophrenic spectrum disorders. A neurodevelopmental disorder is any disorder that impairs the growth and development of the brain and or central nervous system. This can affect emotion, learning ability, self-control, and memory. A neurocognitive disorder refers to decreased mental functioning due to some other medical disease that is not a psychiatric illness. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, is a chronic mental illness that includes attention difficulty, hyperactivity, and impulsiveness. ADHD often begins in childhood and can persist into adulthood. It can attribute to low self-esteem, troubled relationships, and issues with school or work. Autism Spectrum Disorder is a complex developmental condition that involves persistent challenges in social interaction, speech, and nonverbal communication. Individuals on the spectrum can be either high-functioning or low-functioning. Alzheimer's disease refers to a progressive disorder in which brain cells degenerate and die, leading to severe cognitive decline, especially in memory. One in ten people over the age of 65 is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Delirium is going to be an abrupt change in the brain that causes mental confusion or emotional disruptions. Delirium makes it difficult to sleep, pay attention, or even just think. That about wraps up our neurodevelopmental disorders. So now let's take a look at one of the more severe mental health disorders, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a psychological disorder in which the ability to function is impaired by severely distorted beliefs, perceptions, and thought processes. Two major symptoms of schizophrenia are hallucinations and delusions. A hallucination is a false or distorted perception that seems vividly real to the person experiencing it. Hallucinations can be auditory or visual and can come in many different forms. Delusions are falsely held beliefs that persist despite compelling contradictory evidence. This could be someone thinking that the government placed surveillance equipment in their house to listen in on their conversation. Schizophrenia can be diagnosed with or without catatonia. Catatonia just refers to the abnormal movements or behaviors shown in some patients with schizophrenia. The prevalence of schizophrenia is 1.1% of the U.S. population, or roughly 2.6 million Americans. That 1% does seem like a rather large number for such a rare disorder, but there is a reason for that. What you see on TV shows or the movies is oftentimes not the most typical case of schizophrenia portrayed, if an accurate portrayal at all. Of the 1% of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia, a quarter of them will experience a schizophrenic episode and fully recover. Another quarter will experience recurrent schizophrenic episodes, but often only with minimal impairment to the ability to function. For the other half, however, the illness will become chronic, with the need for repeated hospitalizations and extended treatment. That does it for schizophrenia, so now on to our next set of disorders, bipolar, depressive, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorders. Bipolar is going to be a mental disorder involving periods of depression alternating with periods of extreme euphoria and excitement. Bipolar can be diagnosed as either bipolar 1 or bipolar 2. With bipolar 1, the individual experiences manic episodes. Manic episodes are just a sudden, rapidly escalating emotional state characterized by extreme euphoria, excitement, physical energy, and rapid thoughts and speech. We also see rapid cycling occur, which is when an individual with bipolar experiences four or more episodes of mania or depression in one year. While on the topic, let's clear up another misconception that some people often have. Bipolar is not going to be rapid mood swings. You don't wake up happy, feel angry in the middle of the day, then feel happy again at the end of the day. A bipolar diagnosis, even with rapid cycling, requires several days in a row of manic or depressive symptoms, not hours. Bipolar 2 is going to be characterized by hypomania, which are just going to be milder forms of manic episodes. 
Bipolar 1 is generally seen as more severe due to the severity of the manic episodes, which oftentimes require hospitalization. We're also going to have cyclothymic disorder, which is a mood disorder that causes emotional highs and lows, but are not extreme enough to be considered bipolar 1 or 2. This is a great visual representation to differentiate between the three disorders. As you can see, we have mania, hypomania, euthymia, which is just a normal, tranquil mental state or mood, and depression. We then have bipolar 1 represented with our green line, bipolar 2 represented with our red line, and cyclothymic disorder, our orange line. Our y-axis represents emotional state, while our x-axis represents time. You can see that the emotional changes in bipolar 1 are much more extreme, and we also see how cyclothymic disorder is close to bipolar, but the severity of the emotional change is not quite severe enough to meet the diagnostic classification. Now on to depressive disorders. Major depression is going to be a mood disorder characterized by extreme and persistent feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness. These feelings cause impaired emotional, cognitive, behavioral, and physical functioning considered the common cold of mental health disorders, an estimated 17.3 million adults in the U.S. had one major depressive episode. According to the DSM-5, depression can also be seasonal. Seasonal Affective Disorder, or SAD, is a mood disorder in which episodes of depression typically occur during the fall and winter and subside during the spring and summer. One biological explanation for this disorder is that because in these months we're receiving less sunlight, leading to a deficiency in vitamin D, which some studies have linked to depressive symptoms. Persistent depressive disorder, or PDD, is a disorder involving a chronic feeling of depression that is often less severe than major depressive disorder. However, it can last for years and impact several areas of life. And our last mood disorder is going to be premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, which is going to be characterized by severe mood and behavioral changes that occur during the onset of menstruation. Up next, we have anxiety disorders, which are just going to be a category of psychological disorders that lead to severe feelings of worry that impact everyday life. Generalized anxiety disorder, or GAD, is severe ongoing anxiety that impacts daily activities. Individuals with GAD are anxious over a wide variety of life circumstances, and when one source of worry is removed, it is replaced with another one. Panic disorder is going to be characterized by a sudden episode of extreme anxiety that rapidly escalates and intensifies. A panic attack generally consists of a pounding heart, lightheadedness, and difficulty breathing. Generally speaking, they last no longer than 10 minutes. A phobia is going to be a strong, irrational fear of something specific. A specific type of phobia, agoraphobia, is fear of places or situations that might cause panic, helplessness, or embarrassment. As a result, people with agoraphobia generally like to stay inside their homes. Agoraphobia is oftentimes confused with social phobia or social anxiety, which is just going to be a chronic mental health condition where social interactions are going to cause irrational anxiety. Selective mutism is going to be a consistent failure to speak in social situations where there is an expectation to speak, even though the individual speaks in other situations. Mainly seen in young children, an example could be a fourth grader who talks at home with his family but does not say a word at school even to his peers. Previously categorized as an anxiety disorder in the DSM-4, OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder now has its own category of obsessive compulsive and related disorders in the DSM-5. OCD is characterized as a mental health disorder in which people have recurring unwanted thoughts or ideas that we call obsessions that make them feel driven to do something repeatedly, which we call compulsions. These obsessions oftentimes lead to feelings of anxiety that the compulsions help clear up. OCD is much more complex than being annoyed by an item out of order. An individual with OCD might feel compelled to wash their hands at scolding hot temperatures for long periods of time, multiple times a day, just in order to not be in a constant state of worry. Often associated with OCD, we have hoarding disorder, which is characterized by persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions because of a perceived need to save them. An individual with hoarding disorder will hold on to several items regardless of monetary or sentimental value. This can lead to serious issues as the homes of hoarders are oftentimes found condemned and unfit to be lived in. 
PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, also formerly categorized as an anxiety disorder in the DSM-4, also has a new categorization in the DSM-5 under trauma and stressor-related disorders. PTSD is a mental health disorder triggered by the exposure to a highly traumatic event which results in recurrent, involuntary, and intrusive memories of that event, avoidance of stimuli and situations associated with the event, negative changes in thoughts, moods, and emotions, and a highly persistent state of heightened physiological arousal. Originally, PTSD was primarily associated with direct experience in military combat. However, more research has shown how PTSD can develop in survivors of other sorts of extreme trauma, such as natural disasters, assaults, terrorist attacks, and a bunch of other things. Researchers have even documented PTSD symptoms in people who were exposed to traumatic images or videos in the media, such as a graphic image related to terrorism or war. And our next category of disorders is going to be our dissociative disorders. Dissociative disorders are just going to be a category of psychological disorders in which extreme and frequent disruptions in awareness, memory, and personal identity impair the ability to function. Our first dissociative disorder we're going to talk about is going to be dissociative amnesia, which is just the inability to recall information such as an event or period of time, specific aspects of an event, or identity and life history. Dissociative amnesia can be diagnosed with or without fugue. A fugue state is where a person loses awareness of their identity and may unexpectedly travel away from home. While in a fugue state, the individual may even assume a new identity. Depersonalization slash derealization is persistent and recurrent experiences of unreality or detachment from one's mind, self, or body, and or one's experiences of unreality or detachment from one's surroundings. And for our last dissociative disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder in the DSM-3, dissociative identity disorder is the presence of two or more distinct personality states or an experience of possession and recurrent periods of amnesia. Quite the controversial disorder as not all mental health professionals are convinced that DID is a genuine psychological disorder. Next, we have somatic disorders, which are characterized by distressing somatic symptoms plus abnormal thoughts, feelings, or behaviors in response to these symptoms. If you didn't already know, somatic symptoms are just going to be any symptoms dealing with the body. Somatic symptom disorder occurs when people feel extreme exaggerated anxiety about physical symptoms. The person has such intense thoughts related to the symptoms that their day-to-day -day life is interrupted. Illness anxiety disorder, formerly known as hypochondriasis, is the preoccupation with having or acquiring a serious illness. Illness anxiety differs from somatic symptom disorder as there is little to no somatic symptoms present with those suffering illness anxiety disorder. Conversion disorder is characterized by altered voluntary motor or sensory function that can't be explained through neurological or medical conditions. There have been cases where individuals have truly believed they were paralyzed from the waist down even though they had a healthy functioning brain and spinal cord. And our last somatic disorder is going to be factitious disorder. Formerly known as Munchausen's disorder, factitious disorder is a mental disorder where someone deceives others by appearing sick, by purposely getting sick, or by self-injury. Factitious disorder imposed upon another, formerly Munchausen's by proxy, is when a family member or caregiver falsely presents others, such as children, as being ill, injured, or impaired. A famous case of this being the Gypsy Rose Blanchard case. And for the final category of psychological disorders we are going to be talking about are going to be feeding and eating plus personality disorders. Anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder characterized by a distorted body image with an unwarranted fear of being overweight. Symptoms of the disorder include trying to maintain a below normal body weight through starvation or excessive exercise. Bulimia nervosa is an eating disorder marked by binging, followed by methods to avoid weight gain, usually by throwing up. Bulimia is potentially life-threatening as the body is being deprived of key nutrients and repeatedly throwing up is not healthy for many bodily systems. 
Personality disorders are going to be an enduring pattern of inner experiences and behaviors that deviate markedly from the expectations of an individual's culture. Personality disorders are going to be characterized into three clusters. Cluster A is going to be our odd and eccentric cluster. Paranoid personality disorder is a pattern of distrust and suspiciousness that others' motives are interpreted as malevolent. Schizoid personality disorder is a detachment from social relationships and a restricted range of emotional expression. And our last disorder in cluster A, schizotypal personality disorder, is a pattern of acute discomfort in close relationships, cognitive or perceptual distortions, and eccentricities of behavior. Cluster B includes disorders that are considered dramatic, overly emotional, and unpredictable thinking. Histrionic personality disorder is a pattern of excessive emotionality and attention seeking. Narcissistic personality disorder is a pattern of grandiosity, a need for admiration, and lack of empathy. Borderline personality disorder, or BPD, is a pattern of instability in interpersonal relationships, self-image, and marked impulsivity. Antisocial personality disorder is a pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. Having antisocial personality disorder does not make someone antisocial. It means that they do not follow established societal norms. Cluster C of personality disorders is characterized by feelings of anxiousness and fearfulness. Avoidant personality disorder is a pattern of social inhibition, feelings of inadequacy, and hypersensitivity to negative evaluation or criticisms. Dependent personality disorder is going to refer to a pattern of submissive and clinging behavior related to an excessive need to be taken care of. And our last personality disorder, obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder, or OCPD. OCPD is going to be characterized by a pattern of preoccupation with orderliness, perfection, and control. Oftentimes confused with OCD, OCPD is a personality disorder where those strive for perfection, while OCD leads to more feelings of anxiousness as a result of intrusive thoughts. And that does it for our psychological disorders. Remember, there are going to be many more disorders than what we just went over, and we also just touched upon the basics of each one. So if any of them confused you in any way, be sure to do some further research to make sure that you understand them. We now know how mental health professionals identify and diagnose mental health issues, but who exactly are these mental health professionals, and how exactly do they treat these psychological disorders? Our main two professions dealing directly with individuals suffering from psychological disorders are going to be psychiatrists and clinical psychologists. A clinical psychologist is a mental health professional with highly specialized training in the diagnosis and psychological treatment of mental health disorders. A psychiatrist, on the other hand, is a trained medical doctor who specializes with treating patients with mental health disorders. While both are considered doctors, a psychiatrist has their medical doctorate, while a clinical psychologist will just have their PhD. Psychiatrists are also allowed to prescribe medication, while clinical psychologists generally work using different forms of psychotherapy. Today, there are multiple methods of psychotherapy used to treat a wide range of psychological disorders. Psychologists generally prefer different perspectives in their attempt to treat psychological disorders. Behavioral therapies center around the behavioral perspective of psychology, believing that mental illnesses can be treated by extinguishing unwanted behavior and replacing it with more adaptive behaviors. Behavioral treatments use the principles of both operant and classical conditioning in order to treat mental health problems. Systematic desensitization, developed by South African psychiatrist Joseph Wolpe, is a type of classical conditioning therapy where the goal is to remove a fear response of a phobia and replacing it with a relaxation response. Flooding is going to be a classical conditioning treatment for phobias where the therapist uses the principles of extinction in order to remove a conditioned response. An example, let's say Sheila has agoraphobia and is afraid to leave her house. A therapist could have her walk a few steps outside each day to show that nothing bad happens. The goal is that the fear response of going outside will eventually go away from being exposed to the outside multiple times. Aversive conditioning refers to the use of something unpleasant or a punishment to stop an unwanted behavior. If someone has a problem with alcohol, they can be prescribed antibase, which is a substance that when ingested causes a very unpleasant feeling. The antibase is mixed with an alcoholic drink in order to create an aversive response to the alcohol. Behavior modification is going to be an operant conditioning therapy where a client seeks a goal and with each step receives a small reward until the intended goal is finally achieved. 
A token economy is when positive behaviors are reinforced with secondary reinforcers, which can eventually be exchanged for extrinsic rewards. The secondary reinforcer is generally some type of token or point that can be saved up. Token economies are often used at institutions to encourage socially acceptable behaviors. Social skills training refers to when a patient or client uses modeling and shaping techniques in order to learn appropriate behaviors. Remember, modeling is just when someone is showing someone else how to do something, and shaping is just rewarding approximate behaviors until the desired goal is reached. Biofeedback is gaining awareness of many of the physiological functions of our body. A therapist may hook a patient or a client up to a device that monitors their vitals. The patient or client will then use different techniques, maybe deep breathing, in order to control their physiological processes, such as their heart rate. Cognitive therapies are going to center around the idea of cognitive restructuring. Cognitive restructuring is the psychotherapeutic process of learning to identify and dispute irrational or maladaptive thoughts. Remember, the cognitive perspective of psychology centers all around our thought processes. Cognitive therapy is going to focus on how our thought process may lead to psychologically ill behaviors. Psychologist Robert Ellis created rational emotive therapy. Rational emotive therapy is based on the idea that anxiety, guilt, depression, and other psychological problems are the result of self-defeating thoughts. Rational emotive therapy has patients or clients identify the ABCs of their own irrational thoughts. Let's say that Becky just got a poor score on her math test, and now she thinks that she's a terrible student and she'll never get into her dream school. Ellis would have Becky first identify the action or activating event that caused the anxiety. In this case, it would be failing the test. Then Becky would have to identify the beliefs that result, so how she feels as a result of her failing the test, which is she thinks she's a terrible student. She would then be asked to identify the consequences of the actions, which would be the anxiety about not being accepted into her dream school. According to Ellis, since beliefs are related to consequences in a cause and effect relationship, changing the belief will affect future consequences of the behavior. So through some type of therapy, if Becky truly were convinced that she still had a shot at getting into her dream school, the anxiety would go away. Psychologist Aaron Beck also developed a form of cognitive therapy with the goal of alleviating faulty and negative thoughts. Beck's cognitive triad therapy looks at how a person feels about his or herself, his or her world, and his or her future. According to Beck, those suffering from depression often have negative views in all three categories. And our last form of cognitive therapy is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a popular integrated therapy that combines cognitive therapy with behavioral therapy. CBT is very popular today in treating patients with depression and anxiety. Insight therapy is a type of psychotherapy in which the therapist helps their patient or client understand how their feelings, beliefs, actions, and events from the past are influencing their behaviors. Psychoanalysis and humanistic therapies are both considered insight therapies. Free association is going to be the process used by psychoanalytical therapists in which the patient is asked to say whatever is on their mind. This helps the psychologist reveal unconscious information about the patient that might be causing psychologically ill behaviors. As we discussed in our last review, Freud believed that dreams were the royal road to the unconscious mind. So analyzing the latent content of dreams is something that is done in this form of therapy. Transference describes a situation where the feelings, desires, and expectations of one person are redirected and applied to another person, most commonly used by a therapist in a therapeutical setting. Catharsis is release of emotional tension after remembering or reliving an emotionally charged experience from the past. According to psychoanalysts, a cathartic experience may ultimately result in the relief of anxiety. Although traditional psychoanalytical therapy is no longer practiced due to the amount of time it takes, modern-day psychodynamic therapy has been a good substitute. Psychodynamic therapy is shorter in duration, less frequent, and involves the client sitting up and talking to the therapist directly, rather than how Freud had it on a couch facing away from the therapist. Psychodynamic therapists do believe that anxieties are rooted from past experiences, but they do not necessarily assume that they are always going to be from infancy and early childhood. Interpersonal psychotherapy is even shorter and aims to gain insight into the causes of problems, but focuses on current relations to relieve present symptoms. And our next form of insight therapy, we have humanistic therapy. Humanists believe that problems arise because a client's inherent goodness and potential to grow emotionally have been stifled by external psychosocial constraints. 
Based on the research of Abraham Maslow and his own workings, Carl Rogers developed client-centered therapy. Client-centered therapy is going to be a type of psychotherapy where the therapist is non-directive and reflective and the client directs the focus of each therapy session. Rogers purposely used the word client over patient. First, the therapist has to show unconditioned positive regard, which is the act of the therapist valuing, accepting, and caring for the client. The therapist must also express genuineness. This is just where they create conditions that allow the client to direct the focus of the therapy. And last, we have empathetic understanding, where the therapist puts themselves in the shoes of the client and looks at the world from the client's point of view. Active listening is also going to be crucial in client-centered therapy. This is just the process of echoing, restating, and seeking clarification of what the client says and does as well as acknowledging the client's feelings. The main goal of client-centered therapy is going to assist the client in reaching self-actualization. Gestalt therapy emphasizes that people organize their view of the world to create meaning. The goal of Gestalt therapy is to push clients to decide whether they are going to allow past conflicts to affect their future or whether they will choose right now to take control of their own destiny. Different methods Gestalt psychologists use include dream interpretation as well as role playing. Gestalt psychology is going to differ from client-centered therapy as it is very directive and therapist-led. And that does it for our forms of psychotherapy. A question often asked is, does therapy even work? Well, how exactly can we answer that question? Well, using a process known as meta-analysis, researchers are able to evaluate the efficacy of psychotherapy. Meta-analysis is just a procedure for statistically combining the results of many different research studies. Through meta-analysis, researchers have found that 80% of untreated people have poorer outcomes than the average treated person. And the last type of treatment we're going to talk about is going to be biomedical therapies. Psychopharmacotherapy refers to the treatment of psychiatric disorders with the use of medication. Let's start off by talking about some of the classifications of medications. Antipsychotics are medications primarily used to manage psychosis. So things such as delusions, hallucinations, paranoia, or disorganized thoughts. Individuals suffering from schizophrenia are oftentimes prescribed these types of medications. Examples include clozapine and antiordazine. Anti-anxiety drugs are going to be prescription medications that help alleviate symptoms of anxiety. Today, one of the more popularly prescribed anti-anxiety medications are going to be benzodiazepines, which include alprazolone, more commonly known as Xanax. Antidepressants are going to be a category of prescribed medications that alleviate the symptoms of depression. A popular type of antidepressant that we talked about back in our Unit 2 review, SSRIs, or Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, alleviate the symptoms of depression by blocking the process of reuptake of serotonin, allowing the neurotransmitter to flood the synaptic gap. SSRIs include medications such as Zoloft and Prozac. Well, what happens when a patient does not react to any type of medication and the symptoms still persist, interfering with their everyday life? On rare occasions, electroconvulsive therapy is used. ECT involves electrically inducing a brief brain seizure to the patient. ECT has been used to treat manic episodes, schizophrenia, and other severe mental disorders, but it's most commonly used to treat severe cases of depression. ECT can be life-saving because of its rapid therapeutic effects, but inducing a seizure into the brain can cause unwarranted side effects, such as severe cognitive impairments dealing with our memory and speech. And last, we have psychosurgery. Psychosurgery is the neurosurgical treatment of mental disorders. Generally, psychosurgery involves moving or manipulating parts of the brain in order to fix a behavioral issue. Remember back in Unit 5 when we talked about the case study of HM? To stop chronic seizures, HM had his entire hippocampus removed. That would be considered an example of psychosurgery. Due to the controversy linked to psychosurgery, today it is only practiced under extreme circumstances. Wow! I know, I know, that was a lot of information, so I bet you know what is coming next. Please be sure you are filling it out in this dope review guide. It'll help you be smart, like me. Also, do the review section. It'll help you make sure you understand everything we just talked about. Anyways, I will see you all next time for our final unit review on Unit 9, Social Psychology.